Hey, what's going on? It's Doug Cunnington here. And in this discussion, I talked to Jesse Lakes from Genius Link. Jesse's a friend of mine and he's been on the show a couple times already. The cool part is Jesse has many, many years of affiliate marketing experience and he has uh, worked with a ton of other people doing Amazon affiliate marketing specifically. So in this discussion, we talk about the best practices for Amazon affiliate marketing and things to look out for, things uh, that we should do to be more effective as uh, affiliate marketers and so on. So it's always great to have Jesse on. Do check out Genius Link, which can help you monetize your international traffic in a uh, kind of a smart way. So I'll put a link in the description so you can check out Genius Link. I personally use it myself and a lot of my students do as well. So it's a great, it's a great product. I really do enjoy it. Let's go to the interview now. Hey, what's going on? Doug Cunnington here from Niche Site Project and The Doug Show. And I'm sitting with my friend, Jesse Lakes from Genius Link. How are you today? I am. I'm doing really well. It is a wonderful Thursday. Awesome. Yeah, very close to Friday. We are recording this very close to Labor Day as well. So we got a long weekend coming up. Do you have any big plans this weekend? Uh, Labor Day might be actual Labor Day for, for my family. So lots of big plans coming up. So yeah. <laughs> big time. Well, thank you very much for taking the time out. I know it's you're, you're busy right now. For the people that don't know you, can you give a little intro and talk about Genius Link just for a moment so people know like where you're coming from? Sure. Yeah, I've been in the uh, affiliate world for quite quite some time now. Started diving into it back in uh, early 2000s, but um, along the way, I found that uh, links traditionally send people to one destination. That wasn't always the best case. So, kind of had this crazy route with iTunes and then Amazon, and ultimately uh, built this um, platform called Genius Link. That's an intelligent intelligent link management platform. I gotta get that a little bit smoother one of these days since I talk about it all the time. But uh, intelligent link management essentially just means that you can use a single link to help monetize your whole list of audience, um, your whole range of audience. A lot of times when you build a website, uh, you're, you're getting people from the US or the UK, um, but that's usually only a, a decent chunk of your property or a decent chunk of your audience where really uh, your property is being appreciated by people all over the world. And when you don't monetize that long tail of your audience, you're really leaving money on the table. So Genius Link is a, a tool for exactly that. We, uh, we help our, our clients, our publishers, influencers, creators uh, take full advantage of the um, opportunity that's presented with them with this, this community that they've built and also help ensure a good buying experience for that community as well. So it kind of goes hand in hand. Very good. And if people want to hear more about your origin story, we recorded another episode where it was more uh, conversational <laughs> the the, uh, the quick hitter sort of topic that we're doing today, which is the best practices for Amazon associates. And we have a list of, I believe, nine. We'll see how <laughs> we do here. Some of those may turn into like two or three as we dissect them. So we're just kind of going to go back and forth. And when I was reviewing the list, I could tell you, um, number one, uh, Jesse's very thorough. He did all this research <laughs> for me. You know, I'll give you credit. Thank you. I'm not ashamed of that. You know, you got to surround yourself with smarter people than yourself. So I thought that's what I was doing, hanging out with you. Come on, Doug. <laughs> oh, so in this case, uh, Jesse brought to the table a lot and we're just going to like go down the list. So number one, we have make sure you link to products, not to search results pages. So I know I've done this in the past where maybe I didn't quite know where to send someone and I thought, hey, if I just get them to Amazon, that's good enough. So what, what yeah. do you think about this, Jesse? Well, you know, maybe we should rephrase that slightly. You know, it's okay to link to search results pages, but it's best to link to products. And there's kind of a... A theoretical point of view, but there's also some concrete stuff that's really starting to materialize. So the, the theoretical point of view is that um, when you get someone excited about a product and they have that intent to purchase, you want to get them to that ability to purchase as quickly as possible. And it's easier to buy from one of the product pages on Amazon than it is from a category page or a search results page or even the home page of, of Amazon. So you, know, you talk about this camera, you talk about whatever it may be, people are interested, click that button make it happen, allow that to happen. Um, the second part of that, though, is we've seen some new language introduced by Amazon um, earlier this year. And it's uh, this whole concept of what they call an indirect qualifying purchase versus a direct qualifying purchase. 
Uh, and this, this showed up in the, uh, I believe, the March 3rd update to the uh, Amazon European Terms of Service. Uh, and the gist was that they're going to pay you out a commission rate that's significantly higher for a direct qualifying purchase uh, and significantly lower for an indirect. So just some examples here, I'll pull this up. But um, if you are in the um, uh, in the fashion area, so clothing, accessories, et cetera, they're gonna pay you 11 or 12% if you send the link directly to the product page. They're only gonna pay you 1.5% if you send it to a search results and, and kind of something happens along the way, what we often call a kind of a halo purchase. So you know that's, that's obviously a significant difference. So if you're promoting clothing, accessories, shoes, handbags, et cetera, don't use search results pages. You know, really, you want to focus in and send people to to that specific product when you can. Obviously, you can't always do that. Sometimes a search results page is the perfect example of, or sorry, the perfect destination um, for for certain cases. But in general, if you if you have the choice, you know, go to that that specific product where where the search is. Again, it's 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 lazy. It's sometimes, um, and that's why I've done it in the past is because I was being lazy. Uh, but find the right product. Give a good recommendation, send them there, and you should be rewarded for a, with a significantly higher uh, commission rate. Um, so, one quick, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, um, just as an example for when the search page may be more relevant than some others, is like if you're just like mentioning an overall brand, for example, mm -hmm. where you know maybe there's not a brand page for some reason, there probably should be like an overall uh, brand page. But um, another place you may see that is like if it's just uh, the name of a product type and you're not mm -hmm. making a recommendation. So it would be like a more general type of uh, piece of content or something like that. So sorry sure. to interrupt you. What were you going to say? Oh, so um, I was just going to take this one step further where, again, this is, you know, in the European fee statement uh, appendix is where this information is, is listed out. Uh, it doesn't seem to have been applied yet to the U.S. Uh, Amazon.com affiliate program. So obviously uh, Amazon.com is, is typically the biggest affiliate program and, and typically the, uh, the major moneymaker for, for most uh, publishers. However, if you look closely, um, you won't see it in the Amazon Associates dashboard, but if you actually download the reports, you'll see that there's a column now that will give you the DQP and the IQP. And that just tells you, you know, if it's if it's a direct qualifying purchase, an indirect qualified purchase. So I'm reading tea leaves here. You know, take this with a massive grain of salt, but we see it specifically outlined in you know UK, Germany, Italy, Spain, France. We see the reporting is there for the U.S. I'm assuming it's only a matter of time. Um, again, take that with a grain of salt. Do with it what you will. But in general, I definitely recommend your audience, you know, link to products when they can. And, and try not to to be lazy and link to search. But again, you, you make some great points about when linking to search is you know, the best for, for the, kind of that user experience. And quick, um, we got to be careful not to go too long and I'm catching myself here, but like for the <laughs> qualifying versus non-qualifying. So if someone were to link to a product and then mm -hmm. the person, the, the user follows the link, but they buy something else, um, but they they went through a direct link to a product and they just happened to choose a different one. Is that a qualified purchase? That's a great question. And I'm not qualified to answer that. But the way that I read the tea leaves here is that the indirect qualifying is kind of that halo effect, right? You promote uh, a specific TV, they buy toilet paper, right? That toilet paper, you're now going to be at that lower rate. But that TV, if they had bought it, that link that they followed initially, you would get the higher rate. And I think it's We've always known that that Amazon is amazing for those 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 Halo purchases, right? You can be recommending again TVs and be making a ton of money off of toilet paper, uh, which which works out really well. And I think Amazon is is really kind of wisened up to that, and and you know they still want to reward you. You know it's still a sale. You still bring in a customer. You, you deserve something, but maybe not that full amount that they they previously were. So again, to, to restate, I think that you know you link to a specific product, you'll get the full commission if that specific product is bought. But if it's a an ancillary product or related product, I'm guessing not. Again, I, I, I can't prove that. I don't have any specific numbers there, um, but that's that's how I'm seeing, seeing things written. Okay, that makes sense. We will uh, keep monitoring it. All right, <laughs> Definitely. so moving on to the next one here. Um, this is sort of similar to mm -hmm. like, you know, be direct. So this one you mentioned, uh, don't direct or yeah, don't link to the Amazon homepage. And you also mentioned that, you know, Amazon's sort of cracking down on this. So what can you shed some light on here? Yeah. So again, we, we see that 
it's often worth your while from a fiscal perspective to to send to a specific product. Um, again, kind of talking about the the direct qualifying, indirect qualifying. Uh, but we've also found that. Um, Amazon's compliance team seems to be cracking down again. It's a little bit again of, of reading tea leaves to try to understand exactly what they were had concerns about. But we've uh, we've seen some clients come through that uh, believe they were were getting the the letter of doom because they were linking directly to the Amazon homepage. Um, so take that one step further. Amazon wants you to promote products. Amazon doesn't want you to incentivize clicks. Amazon doesn't want you to kind of mooch off their affiliate program. You need to be adding value. I think they see it, again, reading tea leaves, they see it as you just linking to the homepage, as you just trying to collect a commission for being there. You know, the incentivizing clicks, asking for for people to, to buy from your link. You know, the Amazon homepage link often correlates very closely with that behavior where recommending a specific product, you know, you're really doing the job to promote that product. Talk about the, the pros and the cons, you know, your, your insights into that specific product versus just that, that homepage link. Okay, so... I guess trying to understand why those uh, specific users maybe were, um, I guess not not targeted, but why they were, you know, had an inquiry or whatever. Um, I guess they had a high percentage of their clicks going to the homepage, and Amazon was like, "Hey, this is out of whack for like the average site. We have they have a ton of data." So, mm -hmm. am I reading into that properly? Do you think? Again, you know, I'm my I am not related to Amazon in any any way. I am not a a third party company sure. um, that works a lot in the ecosystem. But I think you're you're probably reading things correctly. Um, I have heard that Amazon kind of has a scoring system for for their associates. You need to have you know it's a lot of different factors that go into it. They won't explain it at all. You know, it's kind of a, a hidden thing. Um, but I'm assuming yeah that the score was high in the wrong areas or really low because of this activity. So, um, yeah, I, I'm assuming that some sort of behavior, some sort of incorrect ratio is kind of what, what flagged them. But again, this is complete conjecture. Okay. That makes sense. And yeah, we, I'll, I'll put another disclaimer at the top of this. Uh, <laughs> we are just a couple people talking about this stuff and consult your own lawyers and everything like that. <laughs> We're associated with Amazon or uh, we're hardly associated with each other, but you know. <laughs> all right. So the first few were sort of uh, slightly more negative. So now we're yeah. going to be getting into some more interesting stuff where it's like, hey, give your users um, a bit more choice. So the next one coming up is to potentially give your uh, visitors a choice to... Let's see, I lost my line there, but give your visitors a choice and have multiple retailers. So, you know, Genius Link works with a lot of different companies and you have a very good case study uh, by Armando. So can you kind of just explain what Armando did here, just uh, Cliff Notes version? Yeah, so the gist is we have um, this this tool called a, a choice page. The idea is that you can promote a single product but uh, list multiple buy buttons. And uh, the music industry, this has become kind of the de facto for, for marketing where you, know, you can listen to a song, uh, you can buy it in iTunes or listen to it from Apple Music or you know uh, Amazon's music platform or Spotify, et cetera. So most marketing for music these days happens with these choice pages with this list of different buy buttons. We've seen the, uh, the book industry kind of follow along, right? Uh, you can buy a book, uh, you can read a book uh, via Kindle. You can also listen to it via you know, uh, Audible or, or other uh, uh, audiobook platforms. But that whole concept of one product, one thing to be able to consume in multiple places really plays well into this whole concept of one product, be able to buy it in multiple places. So. We've we've had this tool for a while here, and it's slowly been kind of catching on in the in the product marketing space. Armando is a, a YouTuber that's got a great channel, um, and he kind of saw this early on and started to do Amazon buttons and B and H photo video buttons um, for each of the different products he recommended. And it's been really interesting just kind of hearing his story about uh, once he started doing that, he started seeing immediate results. And over the last, it's been just shy of a year, he's seen his commissions double not only on Amazon. Uh, but he's also become a top uh, referrer for for BNH, uh, which is is really interesting here. If your traffic is approximately the same, you know, not only improving Amazon, but also starting to really see commissions on BNH is is kind of the the perfect answer. So we were really excited when Armando came to us and and told us the story. Wow, yeah, that's pretty awesome because uh, you were showing me the choice uh, 
pages and it seemed interesting, but I wasn't quite sure like the application or, you know, many results. So yeah, it's pretty, mm -hmm. pretty amazing. Uh, I'll link up for Armando's uh, case study there. Maybe I'll try and talk to him as well. That sounds interesting. So, so one quick ahead. caveat here that I think your your audience would be interested in knowing is here. You know, you've really focused in on you know niche niche sites, niche websites. Um, it, it should definitely be be spit out that you know Armando is more on the social media side, more kind of on the influencer side, where you don't really quite have the luxury to be able to put the you know side by side table comparisons or you know to be able to kind of do more of that long form piece where, you know, in a tweet or a YouTube comment, you really only have space for a link or so, maybe a short call to action. So I think the, the I, I would love to experiment with choice pages on websites as well. But, you know, this tool has primarily been more towards kind of that social media influencer side. But again, you know, if you're doing niche sites, you probably have a social media play as well. Um, so there's there's definitely I'm sure some some crossover there. Um, one other th you're going to say something I'm going to cut you off. One other thing that I think is really important. I don't have the perfect answer of why this worked out. We're still dig diving into it. we're doing a bunch of different tests. We've got a bunch of different clients that are helping us out with this. But I think um, what we've seen and what we've kind of started to to unpack from this is just allowing a shopper to be able to do some quick research kind of on the fly, right? Here's here's this product. We often see that Amazon has the lowest price or quickest shipping, et cetera. But we also know that this other two or three retailers are, are notable, well-known retailers. If you can just click on the, the link, look at those other retailers and, and understand, you know, oh, it's out of stock at Target and it's, you know, $5 cheaper at Walmart. Okay, is, you know, is that price difference worth going to Walmart instead of Amazon, et cetera? So it seems that allowing people to click multiple affiliate links to do this purchasing really kind of helps out with that intent to purchase being much quicker, uh, but also allows you to set that affiliate cookie in multiple stores, which can be beneficial as well. So anyway, you weren't asking, nice. but I wanted to throw that out there. No, that's perfect. Um, it, like again, super interesting because I like I know B and H as well, and I've ordered stuff from them for years. So, yeah, I think when I got my camera most recently, like I was gonna buy from Amazon because it was just you know, easier. Because <laughs> that's what you do, yeah. Yeah, and then um, it was out of stock, so mm. I was like, ah, oh, shoot. And I think I bought it from B and H, or maybe I can't remember exactly, but it wasn't Amazon, and that's where I was like, all right, I'm gonna get it. It'll be here like tomorrow, you know, or whatever. And then, yeah, I ordered from somewhere else. Had to wait but, two days. <laughs> but because you switched from, you know, probably some some final review to convince you to buy that camera that sent you to Amazon, Amazon didn't have it, and you jumped over to B&H, the person that made that referral doesn't get credit. Uh, if they had had yeah, that B&H button right there for you to click, they could have earned a commission as well, exactly. in theory. Yep, exactly, exactly. Um, and yeah, just to emphasize that point again, it's probably like the perfect tool for the social media or a YouTuber. And again, I know, um, a lot of, you know, affiliate sites, niche website owners, they are, I mean, they have the keywords right there. They can just create other content that'll go on YouTube and they work uh, very well together and help each other out. So, okay. And let's uh, move on. We'll talk about secondary user access. And you had a note here that that could be an issue. So mm -hmm. what's going on with that? And what is secondary user access? So secondary user access is something buried pretty deep in the uh, Amazon Associate Central dashboard. But the gist is that you can, you can give other Amazon accounts access into your dashboard. Uh, and it works really well for a variety of reasons. But um, we have seen, unfortunately, that you know Amazon has a very strong confidentiality statement as part of their terms of service. And it seems that they are really kind of putting that confidentiality and the secondary access, they're starting to butt heads. So traditionally, we've seen people uh, grant secondary access to, to tools uh, so they can go in and, and pull information for them so they can build links, et cetera. Uh, so they can do due diligence if they're trying to sell the site or, or broker the site for you. Um, unfortunately, it seems that this is not as um, appreciated by Amazon as it, as it once was. Uh, it used to be that secondary access was, it was really easy to, to grant and, and uh, have. But we found uh, that there's been an, an increase in people getting kicked out of the associates program uh, because they've been – sharing confidential information with with people who don't have a confidentiality agreement or or some degree of that so i guess the the lesson here that the best yeah the best practice here is just be really careful if you are granting secondary access to a third party 
and make sure that if you are doing it, you're only doing it for a specific period of time in which some task or something could be happening. Make sure there's some sort of agreement. And then when that's done, just clean up, you know, close out that, that access. Yeah, it's, it's your classic, you know, it's, it's much easier to forget about something and leave it open. But, you know, yeah, those, those diligent business owners know that, you know, that, that following up on, on the task and doing the cleanup afterwards is, is a pretty important piece of having a, a, a clean work environment in the bigger picture. Got it. And yeah, I, I did this when I've sold sites. So, you know, someone needs a broker, for example, mm-hmm. needs to verify the site, due diligence, mm-hmm. as you mentioned, and then they check and make sure that the reports are authentic and that sort mm-hmm. of thing. And I'm pretty sure I need to double check now that we're talking about it, that I'm paranoid enough. And I was like, hey, I don't want them rooting around in my account. So I'm, mm-hmm. I turned it off immediately. Um, but I'll double check because, you know, it's a long time ago. People forget, like you said. Exactly, exactly. And it's, you know, Amazon's built in some safeguards. They can't go in and play with uh, where the money's deposited and, and such. But still, it's that information is is valuable. That's important. So there's there's no need to to leave them open. Yeah, just just be smarter about that. Um, and I think that was a bit of a wake up call for the community. But it makes sense. Yeah, I, I don't blame Amazon one bit for for cracking down on that. Yep. And I think you know. It's important to know, like we're talking about Amazon cracking down on certain things. I mean, it's really, it's not like Amazon's trying to be mean to us specifically. It's just, you know, they're running a business. There's a lot of folks out there. They're trying to manage uh, this whole uh, affiliate uh, sort of population, this collective of folks. And there's some, you know, bad players out there or whatever. So you know, for Amazon, they want to have a good customer experience. That's why we buy from Amazon. We love, I know I, I love Amazon. You love Amazon, right? Yeah. So and that's on the record. So we can, we're on the record <laughs> saying that. Uh, but yeah, the customer trust is big and I will let you intro this next one coming up. Yeah. So customer trust is, um, you know, we had the conversation uh, during the last podcast, really kind of, uh, you know, things, things to be wary of, things, things to avoid. And, you know, the Amazon operating agreement, their policies page, you know, there's so much thick documentation, thick in, in a good way. You know, there's it, they lay it out for the most part, pretty cleanly about what is and isn't okay. And, you know, it's really the rules of how to play the Amazon affiliate game. Um, and you had that audit, uh, you know, you went, you went through the experience. Um, you know, it was, it was, it was hard to sometimes kind of decipher what is and what isn't okay. This is this is gray area. Yeah, I could I could see it being meaning two different ways. And I think this whole concept of customer trust is really a good north star for navigating that. Right? What what is right? What what helps the customer feel? like they can trust what you're putting in front of them. You know, are, are you, are you being clean in your descriptions? Are you, are you being authentic? Are you, are you misleading? Are you identifying when the, when the customer is going to leave the site? Um, are you, are you telling them where they're going to go, et cetera? So just in, in our conversations with, with Amazon, you know, customer trust comes up regularly and it's, I think just a, a really important concept to remember that this is again, kind of that North star that kind of helps guide what is and isn't okay. So yes, you could probably make a case for this and that, and you're, you're going to lose, right? Amazon has the rules that are going to follow those rules. So no matter how much you try to convince yourself that what you're doing is actually gray area or legit because you're rereading the rules in a certain inflection, you know, I think the customer trust really helps at least me understand what that, that intent is, uh, if there's any gray area, kind of use that. Um, and one of the things I thought was also kind of helpful in that is customer trust is a great way to kind of review um, your calls to action. Um, so one of the things that we we saw that was kind of interesting is, you know, playing with your calls to action, as you know, can, can definitely mess with your click-through rate. And click-through rate uh, really adds a lot. So, um, you know, we had a, a client that kind of had a, a little bit more of a aggressive uh, call to action and, and you know, we kind of looked at that a little bit and kind of, you know, talked to the client and did some research and, and Amazon's kind of came back and um, gave us some, gave us some feedback. But one of the things that we thought was really interesting is this whole concept of, of weasel words, um, you know, using best or discount or lowest or sale, you know, words that kind of imply or push the, the consumer and not really kind of let them make their own decision. Yeah. You know, that, that trust really, really isn't there. So, um, no hard and fast rules here uh, for for the audience, but just use that customer trust as the north star. What 
what is the best for the for the customer try to avoid you know again incentivizing the clicks pushing them being shady right you know you as a customer you want to make that decision when you make that decision yeah you're probably going to see good results but if you're getting pushed into something your conversion rate's probably not going to be what it should be okay and this i i made those mistakes early on where basically i was using a superlative that i wasn't sure right like mm -hmm. there was no way that it could always be accurate and you know going back to the perfect customer experience it's like expectations are set when i b before i click the link and then i see what i expect to see on the other side and then you know i buy something and i get that thing mm -hmm. so i think if you avoid again the superlatives and that is like lowest price or best price or biggest discount or something like that and i'm just making mm -hmm. those up arbitrarily but mm -hmm. i think if you avoid those sort of things that may be false then um you're probably in good shape so i would completely agree with you you have to remember too you know amazon's marketplace is crazy dynamic right what was lowest price a minute ago may not be lowest price now those those prices are in fluctuation so again when you when you say yeah the superlatives that may not always be true. You're violating that customer trust. So yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And um, during the like audit situation that we mentioned before, like I, I thought maybe I had a couple instances of that left over from way back in the day. And I did. So I just did like a global search all over my site, found the, you know, two or three and, you know, removed them, cleaned them up, made them, you know, more uh, like customer centric. So, mm -hmm. Perfect. And uh, okay, let's move on to like the global links and the international Amazon Associates program. So I know I, I actually left money on the table for a few years just because I wasn't paying attention. There wasn't a uh, solution that I was aware of. I didn't know about Genius Link yet. <laughs> yeah. um, but once I did, I started earning more money. So if you if you are getting enough traffic, then it's a good way to you know make more money from the existing traffic. Now, Jesse, you have some recommendations on like the amount of traffic than what that one needs to see um, mm -hmm. to kind of gauge whether it's going to be worthwhile. Exactly. So, kind of the general rule of thumb is if you have at least ten percent of your traffic that's international, and ideally international from one of Amazon's fifteen different storefronts, right? So, I let's take a quick step back, right? Amazon is not just Amazon.com. Amazon has 15 different storefronts around the world. So Amazon.com is just one, Amazon.ca, Amazon.com.mx, Amazon.co.uk, et cetera. And each of those storefronts have, each except for Netherlands, has its own affiliate program. So again, most websites, most social media, you know, uh, posts, et cetera, have some sort of international audience. You know, the internet is, is global. So when you don't, when you're sending everyone to Amazon.com, and even if they're coming from Amazon.de, or sorry, from Germany, they may not want to buy at Amazon.com because Amazon.de is is optimized specifically for them, or Amazon.in for for people in, in India, or Amazon.co.jp for for the Japanese population. So by paying attention to that that audience, you can take you know the 10,000 clicks a month that you get, and you can monetize. A much bigger chunk of that instead of saying all to amazon.com and really only be able to monetize or efficiently monetize you know half or three quarters of that you now can make sure that each person goes to the storefront and the product that you're recommending in that local storefront and then you can take advantage of those affiliate programs as well so taking that step back you know 10 percent hopefully from one of the countries that have uh, an amazon store so if you see you know five percent of your traffic from from uk and 3% from Germany and 2% from France, you're a perfect candidate for, for you know, really paying attention to that kind of long tail of, of affiliate links. The flip side of that, and you know, we, we had a conversation about this a, a little bit ago, until you have, you know, there's a lot of things to focus on. There's a lot of things, you know, when you're first starting out that you really need to pay attention to. This is not one of them. You know, you need to have a community. Uh, make sure that community, that audience, that traffic is, is really starting to grow. So while 10% is a good metric, the other side of it is you should probably have at least a thousand clicks coming from international as well. If you're only getting tens or, or hundreds, yes, you can start to monetize it, but <laughs> making five bucks in Germany every month doesn't really matter, right? It's, yeah, when it's getting to 20, 50 a month, that's when it starts to add up and that's when it's worth your time. When it's just kind of that low, low amount, it often isn't, you should spend your time on, um, other things that are going to help boost that traffic, help help build the site, you know, help help grow things. This is definitely a mid to latter 
site maturity optimization. Yep. Totally agree. I won't uh, like repeat what you said. So I have nothing <laughs> to You always do such a great job taking my 10 minutes of uh, blah, blah, blah and turning it into a really succinct sentence though. <laughs> if you get enough traffic, go international. Boom. There That's we it. go. That's what you were trying to say. <laughs> Dog um, for the win again. All right. Moving to the next one. We're talking about getting the right kind of traffic. So I know it's very easy when you're when you're first starting out, you're just like any traffic is going to be great. And maybe you build a site that is not going to have anyone interested in spending money. So no one's going to buy anything. So it's very important to have someone who's like thinking, Hey, I'm, I'm researching a product that I'm probably going to buy in the next 24 hours or so. And that means you're probably looking for, you know, keywords with a product. Um, mentioned and mm -hmm. potentially like I, I like the keyword golden ratio and that that's a concept where you can find like just low hanging fruit um usually you can rank these sort of keywords in these posts really quickly usually within like a couple days or something like that um it's more complex outside of the scope of what we're talking about so <laughs> i'll put a link in the description but if you look for i'll give you a format and then Hopefully people will uh, find it helpful, but let's say ballpoint pens and uh, like a specific user type. So uh, like best ballpoint pen for college students, right? So it's someone is looking for something uh, for a specific application and they kind of have an idea like what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, if you can get someone on your site with that sort of query, like uh, they're interested in buying something soon and most likely um, they just want a curated list instead of going to Amazon and looking at the, you know, 40,000 pens that may be <laughs> out there. Maybe they have a list of like four and they can make a choice from that. So um, any anything to add on on that, Jesse, with like getting the right traffic? No, I mean, yeah, the the keyword golden ratio, yeah, your your newsletter um, is is great for for bringing that up and a lot of education around that. Um, you know, and then just anecdotally, we see you know clients posting links kind of all over the place and doing different different things to kind of get their link clicked, and it's it's pretty amazing where yeah you, you get to be focused, you find kind of that bottom of funnel. Um, you may only need 10 clicks to generate $100 in, in commissions where unfortunately we see some people that just spam their links across Twitter and get tons of clicks and just no conversions because that's just not the right place, the right time, the right messaging to, to actually get the, the volume. Yeah, you got to click and yeah, you, know, you have to get a click before you get a sale, but still you're, you're just kind of blowing out the numbers. It's, it's not it's not being focused. So I think you're absolutely right. We're using using some methodologies to really focus in and, and getting yeah. Top of funnel, medium funnel, bottom funnel, right? The medium to bottom of the funnel is, is really where the magic happens, especially, you know, Amazon having a 24 hour cookie window. You need to make sure that the intent is there. If it's, you know, if they're just researching car tires at the very beginning, you're not going to sell very many car tires. Exactly. And I want to give a, a quick sort of uh, extreme example in the opposite direction. So I have a friend who is, you know, a, a big YouTuber. I think he has like 80,000 subscribers people watch, you know, a lot of his videos, he has a platform, but it's not very targeted. It's actually like, um, like teaching yourself software development. All right. So it's like not a market of people that are interested in buying anything. Like all the tools are free. They're trying to learn on their own. Like they're not paying tuition. So these are just people that aren't going to buy anything. And even though he has a huge audience, many times the size of mine, like he can't sell that much stuff because those people are not interested in buying anything. In fact, a lot of them are maybe they're not even um, like 18 or whatever. Like they're it sounds like there's a lot of high school kids that are like trying to learn how to do software stuff. So like, <laughs> I wish it, I was that focused in high school. But uh, go yeah, ahead. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I couldn't imagine, you know, I couldn't imagine that. But yeah, they're they're like trying to, you know learn something so that they can, uh, you know, have a great job or make money for their family or whatever. So anyway, it's completely the wrong audience to sell anything. So he tried to, you know, pitch a couple things, but it's just not going to pan out in that way. So, right. Yeah. You gotta, gotta go to the other monetization platforms or other techniques at, at that point. Affiliate is probably not the right, the right fit, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 
No, no, that that was it there. So moving on to our last one here, and this is uh, being authentic. So one thing that I notice, and I think maybe I did this a little bit in the beginning as well, but any product that I reviewed, I just made it sound great. You know, I was trying to recommend a product. Um, whether the product was ten dollars or a hundred or a thousand dollars, I was like, these are all great. Anyone would be happy with any of them. I give them, you know, a hundred stars, whatever. Like, <laughs> hey, you'll love it. And that's just not realistic. It seems like all the credibility is gone if you're if a person is recommending like all the products when clearly some are better and some are worse. Now, the good part is. I think some people always want to buy the most expensive thing. Some people always want to buy the cheapest thing. Um, so if you give them options, usually like people will gravitate towards where they're most comfortable. Um, and the whole punchline here is I think it's really important to offer pros and cons for any of the products you're reviewing. So even if it's the greatest product in the world, um, maybe it's a little expensive, you know, or maybe it's hard to get they, because they're so fantastic. Um, they're rare. They sell out often. So that could be a con. It's just important to be authentic. So I, th I bet you've seen a lot of sites, Jesse, where, you know, maybe they weren't doing that. So do you have any, what, what do you have to add here? No, I think you're, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. Um, Pat Flynn, um, is, you know, has done a really good job kind of talking about how to be authentic with, with affiliate marketing. I really subscribe to, to that methodology that you know you have to be proud of what you do you have to believe in what you do and when you're not being when you're not being authentic it's really hard to do that you know it's not something you take to your mom and and tell her you know what you what you're working on or or you know really be proud to tell anyone in your family what you're what you're working on but when you can actually you know add value you know give give both sides of the story i, I think that even just kind of comes back to the whole customer trust thing right they're going to believe you um, you worked hard to, to get that, right? You have to see both sides of the story. You want them that, you know, you said seven pros and didn't give the three cons. They, they get that package that shows up, they open it up, they start using it. And the, you know, yes, the seven pros are right there, but the three cons you didn't talk about are the first three things they hit. They're going to be a little upset, right? And they're probably not going to trust you for the next review. You're, you're not building that, that loyalty. Um, so in the bigger picture, you know, it's, we are, craftsmen you know our, our work is you know mostly over the the keyboard but we should be proud of what we build and what we make and if we're not then maybe this isn't the right business for us very good yeah and i think well again i don't want to be uh like uh, redundant and just repeat but yeah if if you could be authentic and like help the customer out as much as you can then uh that's about all you could do so all right. Well, Jesse, thanks a lot for uh, joining us here. Um, I will link up all your stuff in the show notes and everything, but any parting words before we finish up here? Always, always a pleasure, you know, riffing, riffing on uh, best practices about Amazon or really anything about Amazon as uh, yeah, always a pleasure going, going deep. Awesome. Well, have a great day there and we will uh, catch up soon. Thanks. All right. Cheers. Thanks again to Jesse Lakes over at Genius Link, and I'll put in a, a plug again for the upcoming interview about acquiring companies. And Jesse also uh, sort of put his commentary on a blog post that I wrote about an Amazon audit. So Amazon audited my my full associates account, and uh, Jesse again he has a ton of experience with the. Um, the associate program and he interfaces with way more affiliates than, than I do by, by a huge margin. So anyway, he put in his own thoughts on like what I wrote out. So anyway, I'll put a link to that. It's over on the genius link blog and I will catch you on the next video. Have a great day out there.